Right, so just to point out the data plate. So we've got the data plate up here on the side of the tank, which is going to tell us all about the vehicle. We've got all the appropriate information stamped on the side here. And when we were talking about tank testing, the fact that this tank should be tested every 12 months, then that should be recorded with stampings actually on this side of the plate. Because the vehicle is brand new, there won't be a tank test shown actually on the plate. So this time next year, we would expect to see some information stamped on the plate there to tell us that the vehicle has been tank tested. Okay, so, uh, resealer valve. We've got the resealer valve on this side with the hose, the valve's tucked up underneath here. Resealer valve is for resealing the gully once you've emptied it, if you were operating on this side. Hence, we've got two resealer valves, one this side and one on the near side. And we've also got the temporary part for the boom. So if we were doing gullies on this side of the road, for example, if we're going down a one-way street, uh, or you're going around a roundabout, um, and you're using the boom on this side of the vehicle, when you're moving from gully to gully, you've got a temporary part. You can put the gully in place and put the chain around it. But it, it is only a temporary part. If you're going to be going back to the depot or moving any significant distance, then the boom needs to be secured in its cradle on the near side of the vehicle where it is now. So that's your temporary part for the boom. Resealer valve for the gullies on this side. Small little control panel here that we can operate the vacuum pump. We can also open and close the boom valve. So if you've got a machine where you haven't got the control buttons actually on the control handles on the boom itself, then we can operate the pump with this little panel here. Our blue tank, we don't need to worry about, not part of the tank in operations. And then the next thing we've got is actually the, the grip filter itself. So we're gonna have a look at the grip filter. Okay, all new machines now come with crash barriers to stop people from going underneath. We can actually get the grip filter out without having to take the, the barrier off. Um, and we can actually operate the secondary cutout tank and all the other little bits and pieces as well. So just gonna demonstrate for you how to take the filter out. Now these eye bolts should only really be hand tight, but because it's a new machine, it's likely that they've been nipped up. So all we need to do is put a screwdriver through the eye bolt and we should be able to just gently release each one. So we're going to take the filter out and check the condition of the filter, expect it to be nice and clean. Now this needs to be done on a regular basis. If you read the label, it says that this filter should be checked daily. You don't need to worry too much about doing it every day, but it needs to be done at least once a week. And it would be a good idea when you're doing these uh, filters not to be parked over a gully because uh, that can uh, be quite a disaster when you drop an eye bolt and it disappears down the gully. So we're in a good place where we are at the moment. Last one coming off. We've got all four eye bolts out. We should be able to pull the cap off the front of the filter. Bear in mind you've got two O-rings and you can see both things o-rings there nicely greased up make sure that they're there now if the machine's been used for a while this is going to be quite mucky this can all be wiped out with paper towel or a rag make sure the o-rings are still there the sleeve that's what we're looking for needs to be nice and clean you should be able to see through it so when you look through the mesh you should be able to see through it if that's all blocked up and you can't see through it then it needs cleaning that can be washed pressure washed if you wanted to um, if you are going to pressure wash it then the best way of doing it is with a traffic cone so put a traffic cone down drop that over the top of the cone and then you can pressure wash it and clean it all off if you put it on the floor it's going to roll away from you so that looks lovely and clean inside the housing itself you can see it's all nice and clean 
you've got an o-ring at the back okay we're going to make sure that that's there again if it's been used for a while that would be quite mucky you've got to wipe all of that out with paper towel or a rag don't put any water in the housing so i'm happy with the condition of that filter and you can see it looks very clean it doesn't matter which way around it goes it's the same both ways when you put the filter back in you need to make sure that you push it all the way in it's got to go up above the lip and then we can get the cover back on again and get them all nice and clean o-rings are all in place and really when you're tightening up these eye bolts you should do it diagonally as if you were changing a wheel on a car make sure that it sits nice and square then so we just nip that one up and then do the opposite diagonal eye bolt like that And they only really need to be hand tight. That's fine. So that's the grip filter done. Whilst we've done the grip filter, we might as well move on to the pressure relief valve. There's two of these, remember? This is the inline PRV. The other one's up on the top of the tank. We need to make sure that's functioning. So by pulling on it, you should see we've got a bit of movement there, which is fantastic. We can actually test that under pressure a little bit later on. This is your secondary cutout tank. So there's a ball in a cage, same as the primary inside the main tank. So when this fills up, it pushes the ball up, seals it off at the top and uh, stops any more load going into the machine. Directly above the tank is your snifter valve. So we're gonna check the operation of that just by opening it and then closing it again and that's working correctly. Primarily designed as a brake vacuum, but we're now used really to stop the load from frothing and foaming and you can gently crack it open and hopefully that will reduce the frothing and foaming inside the machine it also in its fully open mode cools the vacuum pump down so we need to make sure if we do open the valve that when we finish whatever we're doing we close it again otherwise you won't build up any vacuum secondary cutout tank has a drain valve underneath and we can open that by pushing the lever down you can see there's a little bit of residual that's come out from the bottom. That doesn't necessarily tell us that the tank's empty. If you read the label, we should be emptying this regularly, at least once a day. But again, we can do it weekly, but we should be emptying it under pressure. So there's a little procedure that we're gonna go through later explaining how to empty the secondary cutout tank under pressure. I'll close it for now. Whilst we're along the bottom here, that's the Solberg valve or the DV4. That's an automatic snifter valve that opens to really reduce the vacuum, stop the tank from imploding, technically. Uh, there is a filter in there. We don't need to worry about it too much. It's a paper filter with a sponge around it. And because it's only allowing air to get into the machine, it doesn't get very dirty. <coughs> We've got the vacuum pump itself. There's the vacuum pump. Looks a bit like an electric motor. You've got the cooling fins on the outside to help cool the pump down. You've also got this little assembly at the front. This is known as the tickler. So when we pour this little green wire, in effect what it does is speed up the total loss lubrication system. So you're repriming the pump. If you should ever run the total loss lubrication system oil reservoir out of oil, then this is the way we prime it back up. We hold this out whilst we're looking at the dripper domes which are directly above us just here and by holding that out as soon as you see oil dripping in those domes you know that there's enough oil then getting down into the vacuum pump so once you're happy that they're dripping okay you can let go of it and then they will continue to drip we've got all the lubrication tubes that come down to various points on the pump again whilst we're in the same place this is the drain valve for the oil catchment tank remember the oil that goes into the vacuum pump needs to come out and it comes out in the waste air, in the exhaust air of the pump. 
and it gets caught into the secondary catchment, uh, sorry, the oil catchment tank, which is tucked right round the back of the machine. I can put my finger on it now, and it's right at the back of the vacuum pump. So that's your oil catchment tank. So we need to drain this regularly, and we do that by opening this valve here with a suitable container underneath, and we run the vacuum pump don't need to put it onto pressure, just run the packing pump as normal and that will collect any oil or catch any oil that's contained in that catchment tank. Okay, we're just gonna, I'm not gonna open it now because we haven't got a container underneath it, so we need to find one of those in a little while. Just while we're finishing off on this side, this is the oil reservoir for the total loss lubrication system. And you can see you've got your filler cap here need to make sure that the oil level is uh, constantly at the maximum. There is a minimum level indicator on this side to tell you when you're low on oil. So we need stopping up regularly and it's your basic 1540 motor oil that goes in there. Um, and keep an eye on it because it will drop quite quickly if the vehicle's getting a lot of use. That's all associated with the total loss lubrication system. So those are the first little checks that we've done on the vehicle. Uh, we've done the grip filter, we've checked the PRV on this side. We've, uh, we know what the bits and pieces are, we've identified them. We're gonna go through a procedure shortly on emptying the secondary cutout tank and the oil catchment tank.